The story begins at a school where we see the most popular couple being admired by everyone. They are Susan and Kazuki, and they are from the student council. They are the center of attention for all the students, and everyone gossips a lot about them. That's how we meet Yusato, our beloved protagonist. He is exactly the opposite of the two darlings, a dull and completely ordinary high school student, the most exciting things that happen to him are always very simple. Although he doesn't think that's bad, deep down in his heart, he still hopes to experience something very exciting and fantastic. At the end of class when everyone is leaving, it starts raining. Yusato is one of the last to leave and sees that someone took his umbrella. He sees another one there, but prefers not to take it, wanting to avoid trouble in the future. So, he decides to wait for the rain to stop, and hours go by, but the rain never stops. Susan appears and is surprised to see Yusato still there, asking what he's still doing. He tries to explain but feels a bit embarrassed to be talking to the most popular girl in school and tries to leave in a hurry. But Susan says that sending a student out into the rain would harm the student council. Then Kazuki shows up and decides to lend his spare umbrella to Yusato. Yusato is surprised to find out that Kazuki knows his name, even though they are in the same class, and he's very popular. Yusato sees that Kazuki actually seems very nice, just like Suzun. Both of them are very friendly with him and decide to call him by his first name, which makes him happy and surprised. Suzun says it must be fate for them to meet like this. They head home together. For a moment, Yusato even feels special to be going home with the two most popular kids in school. Everyone else would be jealous. He thought Kazuki wouldn't be so friendly, after all, he only talks to the girls in his class, but Kazuki says he only talks to them because they talk to him. He also thought Suzun would be even more inaccessible, despite being one of the top students in the class, she mentions that she's just an ordinary third-year student. Yusato asks if they're really dating since everyone talks about it, but it's just a rumor because they're always together. They're just good friends. Susan asks Yusato what he plans to do after high school, but he still doesn't know, just like Susan herself, who says she sometimes feels like that's not her place. Despite being one of the top students, she also has a lot of doubt about what to do in her future. Then, something strange happens along the way. Kazuki and Susan start hearing bells ringing, but Yusato hears absolutely nothing and gets closer to them to try to understand. At that moment, a golden portal appears beneath their feet. Kazuki wonders if they've stumbled into some kind of filming. But Yusato says it looks like one of those iSky portals, which gets Susan intensely excited, even asking Yusato if in this world they're going to, they can meet heroes, monsters, and magic. Yusato is surprised to find out Susan is into that. Yes, Susan is an otaku in disguise. Everything turns white, and the three of them wake up in a medieval world, in front of a king. Susan is extremely excited, it's exactly what she wanted. The king then begins to speak, friendly and appealing to the three of them. He introduces himself as Lloyd Vulgastlinger, the king. He says they've been summoned to be the heroes there. This makes Susan even more excited, breaking Yusato's view of her. The king goes on to explain that two years ago, they were attacked by the demon king. Oh, what a surprise! They manage to drive away his army, but they're increasing their power more and more. So, they took the last resort, which is forbidden, summoning heroes from another world. Kazuki is furious, how can they do this without their consent? He demands to be sent back, but the king says it's impossible, the summoning magic only works in one direction. Kazuki continues to be furious, he has a family, just like Susan and Yusato, and asks how they expect them to accept this. But Yusato calms him down. Then the king kneels before them and promises to find a way to send them back, but until then, he begs for their help. Susan asks why the three of them, since the king shouldn't know anything about them, so why were they chosen? So, Welsey explains how the magic works, it automatically selects very talented people for the summoning and asks if they heard bells ringing. This indicates they are great heroes. They see that it makes sense, but Yusato didn't hear anything. So, was he involved in all this by accident? Later, Welsey takes them to a room to determine their types of magic using a crystal sphere. Kazuki asks if everything is okay with Yusato. Even though he's not a great hero, he could still be capable of using magic, 
and he's happy to be treated like the other two, although getting angry wouldn't help, so it's better to find something he can do. This surprises Kazuki, who thinks Yusato's thinking is amazing. So, Susan is the first to test the magic sphere. It shines in gold, and we see that her magic is of the thunder type. Then Kazuki tests his type of magic, he has light magic. He asks what it's for, blinding enemies? Susan, with her great otaku intelligence, replies that he can create light weapons, lasers, and various other things. Yusato says Kazuki has no idea what she's talking about, and she retorts that he has a very sharp tongue, although she doesn't hate it. We see that light magic is very rare and incredibly strong against demons. Yusato is next, he really wants to help his two new friends, so the sphere shines in emerald color. This completely scares Welsi, who grabs Yusato and takes him back to the king in a hurry. Upon arriving, Welsi explains that she measured everyone's magic, but when she measured Yusato's, she had a big surprise. Smiling, the king asks if he happened to have shadow magic. But Welsi says the sphere turned green, which immediately scares the king. Welsi tries to say that Yusato has an extremely rare affinity, but the king orders not even to say the name. The king asks them to take him to the safest place possible. Yusato is confused and asks if his magic is really so problematic and if there's anyone else with the same type. The king replies that there is, but he definitely shouldn't meet her. Then, someone arrives at the scene, an incredibly strong woman with long green hair. She asks how the summoning ritual went and if the heroes reached their target. She stands in front of Yusato and asks if he's one of the heroes, but the king immediately replies that he's just a boy who was brought there by mistake, and he's extremely ordinary. Rose stares at the king for a moment and asks Yusato's name. She introduces herself, and thus we meet our formidable Rose, commander of the rescue team. Yusato thinks she seems more like someone who takes lives than someone who saves them. Welsi says the heroes are in the crystal room and asks them to go together. Rose agrees and says goodbye. The king is relieved and then tells Yusato to go rest in his room, but Yusato is still intrigued and asks why so much fuss, what's the problem with his magic being green? This surprises everyone there, they had just gotten rid of the problem, and it surfaced again. Rose immediately stops upon hearing this and looks at the boy, confirming the color of his magic. She quickly says to the king that she'll borrow Yusato, and the king immediately shouts for Welsi, who uses a bubble magic on Yusato and sends him out of the castle. Rose gets excited and starts running at an incredible speed. The king shouts for her to wait, but she ignores him. She runs intensely after Yusato and uses her incredible strength to burst the bubble, grabbing Yusato and landing without any problems. She's happy and then tells the king that she's going to turn Yusato into a great user of healing magic. Later, Welsi explains to Kazuki and Susan that Yusato was taken by Rose to the rescue team. Yusato has an affinity for healing magic, just like Rose, it's the rarest magic of all. The big problem here is that Rose's training methods are a bit different. Her training is well known for being extremely heavy and painful, even causing fear in those who know about it. At night, we see Rose explaining the situation to Yusato, who understands that he's a user of healing magic. Rose calls the rest of the team and tells them to be nice to Yusato. He's scared just looking at them, feeling like an offering. They all introduce themselves, with doubtful smiles on their faces. And they are reprimanded by Rose, who tells them not to scare the boy. Although they think they're being very nice to him. But Yusato thinks they don't know what it means to be nice. Rose reveals that they are from the team but aren't users of healing magic. Normally, healers work elsewhere. So, Rose says she's going to make Yusato learn to use that magic. Every cell in Yusato tells him to run away upon looking at Rose. What a woman. Rose says training starts tomorrow, and today he can have dinner and go rest. The whole group says Yusato is screwed, being trained by the boss herself? It's a true hell. In bed, Yusato wonders what will become of him, but then he thinks he should just sleep, having a small hope that all this is just a dream. Rose thinks she now has a great opportunity with Yusato. In the morning, Yusato sees that it was indeed real. He is visited by his friends Susan and Kazuki. They were worried about him, but Yusato reassures them, saying that for now he's doing fine, although he remembers Rose, 
realizing that his training begins now, unsure if he'll be alive the next day. His two friends are concerned, but Yusato says he wants to do this, he wants to be useful to both of them. They also mention that their training starts today, and Yusato even compliments their uniforms, which makes Susan feel beautiful. Kazuki thanks Yusato, saying that he has finally made a decision, he will give his best from now on. Yusato sees that all this has been hard for Kazuki, but he is adapting well, whereas Suzun. Well, Suzun is loving it. Rose appears there, which terrifies Yusato terribly. That's not a prison, Rose says that Yusato is free to do whatever he wants, except when he's training. So finally his training begins. At first, he finds it easy, Rose only asked him to feel the mana within him. Then she gives him a book about the history and characteristics of that world. Yusato says he probably won't be able to read that language, but Rose says that heroes automatically receive translation magic. The first day was easy, on the second day, Yusato ran intensely for hours until he was out of breath. And so it went on for three days, he ran and ran until he got a terrible cramp. Rose appears there and asks why he stopped. Yusato complains about his legs, but Rose slaps them. As Yusato writhes in pain, he realizes that it doesn't actually hurt, Rose had healed his muscles. And she tells him to run again as if his life depended on it. Yusato curses Rose in various ways, but in his mind. On the fourth day, he started training with other team members but still fell far behind them. On the fifth day, he ran all day, just like on the sixth day. He falls into the mud and sees how much his muscles hurt, then, he starts using healing magic involuntarily. Seventh day, and more running. Rose finds him very slow and is starting to get annoyed, so she increases the difficulty. Eighth and ninth days, and more running, under Rose's terrible supervision, of course. Yusato is thrown into the air several times and ends up using his magic without even realizing it, which heals all his wounds. Tenth day, and now Yusato can heal himself whenever he wants, even curing his fatigue. In other words, he can heal his fatigue now. Rose then tells him to run 30 more laps. The next day, he trains push-ups until nearly a thousand, healing his body when tired and regaining all his vigor. Rose says that he trains his body so much like this so that he can run as fast as possible on the battlefield, running to heal his allies. Rose increases the difficulty of his training. At lunch, he sees that his food disappeared while he was in the bathroom. His colleague says he found it there because someone didn't want it, so he ate it all. This infuriates Yusato, who goes after him. The two run across the field. Yusato sees that he got used to the training quickly. One week after the start of training, his friends visited him again. So they see him doing push-ups with an immense rock on his back and Rose sitting on top. He complains that Yusato is very slow, but he says that she's so light he barely notices. Rose likes that and even puts another rock on him. But Yusato surpasses himself, he heals himself and manages to hold the two incredibly heavy rocks on top of him. This makes Rose admire him, thinking that she may be able to take him there sooner than she imagined. This astonishes Susan and Kazuki, wondering if that was really Yusato. Susan notices Yusato's toned muscles and drools over them. Soon Siljus, the knight accompanying the two, complains about Rose's terrible training, how dare she treat a hero like that. But Rose says she doesn't share his ideals, although Yusato may become her right hand. She likes how he hates to lose, he is someone who can survive her training. Yusato sees that his attempt to irritate her had the opposite effect. Rose tells Yusato to go rest, the knight asks them to take care of the princess who was with them while he discusses kingdom matters with Rose. Later, Yusato talks with his friends, he sees that they were training fencing with that knight. Until then, Yusato hadn't realized that the other girl was the princess. So they eat a pie she brought them, and Kazuki asks if Yusato doesn't find this training too heavy, but he says it's actually lighter today. Kazuki mentions that their training is quite strict, but despite everything, they care about their health, unlike Rose. Yusato grabs another piece of pie, and Suzun, with her sharp eyes, sees Yusato's big developed muscles and quickly lifts his shirt, asking if she can take a peek and touch them a bit. Susan's spirit is very amusing. Yusato, all embarrassed, tries to change the subject, saying that Kazuki had something to say. So Kazuki asks if all this isn't too hard for him. 
But Yusato says it's okay, it's not so bad, although the training is tough, they are all very nice and even have a lot of fun. His magic is healing, and he wants to help them a lot. Susan then asks if he'll save her when she's in trouble. Could they form a romantic pair? I'm starting to like them together. At that moment, his colleague brings his lunch. This angers Yusato, holding a grudge from the last time his lunch was eaten. The two start fighting, worrying the princess, but Kazuki sees that everything is fine. This is part of Yusato's days, which makes him restless and eager to return to training. So they head back to the castle. Susan says she's sure the three of them have some connection, and she really likes that. At night, Yusato takes a bath and remembers his friends, getting chills when he thinks of Susan. But she's right, his body is developing very fast, he wonders if he has a mind that matches this body, if he can really save everyone who needs it with his magic. The next day, Rose decides to take Yusato outside, the day has finally come, the day Yusato will fight against the wilderness. So Rose tells him not to come back until he hunts a great beast. Yusato totally disagrees with all of this, he only ran all this time, he didn't learn to fight. But Rose gets irritated and simply throws him away. <laughs> Yusato is going to end up dead if he lands like that, he even anticipates the news afterward. But he refuses to perish there, so he starts using his healing even while free-falling and uses his arms and legs to land, healing them immediately afterward. He begins to think about the monstrous bear that Rose asked him to bring, and starts to think it might not be a big deal, when one appears right there, he gets scared and runs for his life, but he still thinks Rose is much worse than the bear, so he turns around, ready to face it. But then two more blue bears appear, this is just unfair. He then runs as fast as he can and hears the sound of a waterfall, so he goes all out and jumps. This causes the bears to give up on him. Later, he hangs his wet clothes and checks his bag, eats something, and prepares for the next day. He looks for traces of the bears, and there he finds a small wounded rabbit, he helps the animal. He finds it very cute, but continues his search. The rabbit follows him, Yusato tries to warn it that he's hunting big monsters, but the rabbit seems to understand him and sniffs the scent of the bears. Yusato follows it and arrives at the bear's den, seeing that they are a family. He even forgets how monstrous they are and finds them quite cute. He watches their movements for a few days using markings on a tree. While gathering some supplies, he observes the bear's routine. At one point, he ends up encountering a giant snake, feeling a huge tremor throughout his body just by looking at it. He sees that thing is terribly deadly on various levels, so he stays hidden and decides not to attract attention. He returns to his daily observation of his prey, but there is an unease filling Yusato's heart, and he couldn't quite distinguish what it was exactly, but he decided to keep observing the bears for a while longer. He ends up liking what he sees. Seeing the bears as a family is a beautiful and cute thing, but he still needs to bring one of them back to Rose, so he decides he'll attack the next day. In the morning, he prepares to go to his objective, but the rabbit tries to stop him by pulling his boot, Yusato insists, but soon gives in and decides to wait for the rain to pass in this case. The rain finally stops, so he sets out in search of his goal. But when he gets there, the bears were already dead. He sees that those bites must be from that giant snake. That wasn't done for food, it was done for fun, the snake simply killed them because it could. Yusato hears a noise, and sees that the bear cub was hiding. Yusato hates to lose, so he doesn't like losing to Rose, and he doesn't like it when all his determination is thrown in the trash. But there's something that goes much beyond that. He doesn't accept this scene before him in any way. Yusato decides to avenge the bears. Seeing Susan and Kazuki, they look for Yusato, but they find out that he has been outside at Rose's command for 10 days now. Kazuki doesn't like it and wonders if he's okay, Susan tries to reassure him, saying she's also worried, but if it was Rose who sent him, it must be okay. Returning to Yusato, he prepares himself, trains his body a lot, and sharpens a wooden spear. He asks the rabbit if it can lead him to the snake as it did before with the bears. They make a long journey and finally reach the destination, there Yusato sees that bear cub trying to face the snake. He quickly runs toward his target. 
Instantly the snake appears in front of him, almost devouring him, but he dodges at the last moment and pierces the enemy's eye with the spear. Thus begins a great fight. He is thrown forcefully by the snake's tail against a tree, but Yusato heals instantly and decides to attack the opponent's blind spot. Using his knife, he tries to attack the snake's tail, but it's faster and manages to bite his arm. Yusato screams in pain, but it was on that arm that he held the knife. He heals himself and wounds the snake from the inside, making it finally let him go. But Yusato starts to feel dizzy. That snake was venomous. So Yusato uses his healing, but this time from the inside out. The fight continues until the bear cub helps. Yusato climbs and gives his all with an incredible punch to the snake's head. It seems his strength went beyond that of a normal human. He pierces the snake even more with the spear. It writhes trying to get rid of Yusato. But it finally stops. Yusato won. He is tired, collapses on the ground from exhaustion. He used all his mana to heal the poison, so the bite on his arm is still open. The bear cub approaches him friendly. But at that moment, the snake gets up. Yusato can't believe his eyes. He can't get up anymore, so he thinks of his friends, can he no longer help them? The giant snake is furious and attacks Yusato with everything. Yusato remembers Rose and blames her for all this. But then Rose herself appears there and finishes off the snake for good. Wow, I have to say that gave me chills. She appears there saying that the snake should have died with Yusato's last blow. He wonders how she got there. Then we see that the little rabbit was Rose's pet all along and it warned her about Yusato and the snake. The rabbit pretended to be injured to gain Yusato's trust. Rose reveals that she had always been nearby in case something happened to him, but she would intervene as little as possible. In fact, she never thought Yusato could defeat the original target, the bear. She wanted him to gain experience fighting something stronger than him, but now, he had practically defeated something much stronger than the giant bear. A Demon King Snake not even an entire army could defeat that. Rose is impressed with Yusato and sees that he is very similar to her. The little bear cub has grown fond of Yusato, so Rose decides to take him too. Yusato sits on the bear's back, and Rose picks them up with one hand. But then, she says she heard him saying certain things. Savage? Violent woman? Ogre? It seems Yusato won't be sleeping tonight. Rose takes them back to the cliff from before and congratulates Yusato for qualifying. None of the other two healing magic users managed to do that. Despite lacking some basic things, he proved he can stand by Rose's side on the battlefield. Strength, physical endurance, and a strong mind, he can be proud. She says that at this rate, they might have time to fight together soon. The Demon King's army is about to attack. So let's go to Amila Vergret commander of the third army of the demon king. Her troops are ready to attack the kingdom. The war is about to begin, and Rose wants Yusato on the front line with her, alongside the vanguard. He's not sure if he can measure up to Rose, even though there are two other healers like him, they have other important roles. Yusato will have to strengthen his determination by then. In the enemy's castle, we see Amila, she is summoned by Hiralok, some sort of scientist, he is eager about his new experiment and shows it to Amila. He presents his new monster weapon, but Amila sees that it's just like the last one, which failed in battle and was defeated by the knight Siglis. The scientist says that this one is much better than the previous, and Amila hopes he's right, there are people stronger than Siglis. They're called kidnappers, a group of people who whisk their wounded to the rear in the blink of an eye, greatly reducing their casualties. And their leader is Rose. She heals the wounded in an instant and is also a highly skilled fighter. Rose harbors a deep animosity toward Amila's master. She wants to deal with Rose herself, she'll lead the troops, so she'll send someone else in her place. Someone known as the Black Knight. Back to our heroes. Yusato is actually happy to hear his colleague snoring again. He feeds his new bear friend, whom he nicknamed Blurin. That rabbit from before is also there, and Yusato calls him a traitor, but he's too cute, and Yusato ends up forgiving him. Rose then appears, she got permission from the king for the bear to stay, 
but it will have to work. In this, it serves as simulation in Yusato's training, as if he were carrying a wounded person in battle. He starts running, but out of nowhere, he's attacked by one of his colleagues. Rose didn't tell him, but he'll also be attacked, just like on a battlefield. After surviving obstacles and attacks for a few hours, Yusato feels strange, he was sure he could run at least half a day, even with the bear on his back, but he's already very tired. Rose finds him and says that on the battlefield, exhaustion won't just come from running but also from fear, nervousness, and impatience. That's why his strength faded faster, he needs to get used to it. Train his mind until he has the mental capacity to deal with all of that. Later, Yusato continues training around the city at Rose's command. At first, everyone is startled by the bear being considered a monster, but they calm down when they see Yusato, his clothes are from the rescue team, so it's okay. He wasn't the first to run like crazy through the city. After he leaves, we meet Amako, she has some interest in Yusato. On the way, Yusato thinks about visiting his friends since he's near the castle, but maybe Blurin will be a problem. A blonde man notices him and tries to call him, but he's incredibly slow. Yusato ends up noticing him and helps him. Rose didn't mention it, but this is Orga Fleur, one of the healers from the rescue team. Orga and his younger sister are healing magic users, but they didn't get along well with Rose's training and work as doctors in the city. Despite not being good at healing himself, he's very good at healing others. Yusato sees that there are different types of healing magic. Still, they're part of the rescue team, but they take care of another sector. On the battlefield, they stay in the rear while the other members bring the wounded for them to heal. They say goodbye, Orga needs to return to his clinic. Despite everything, he tells Yusato not to hate Rose, she's very awkward with people, but she's not bad. Yusato knows that, although he has many things to complain about. Then, Orga's sister appears, complaining about his absence, she's Yururu. Yusato finally arrives at the castle. It's okay for him to enter with the bear, Rose took care of that. Yusato sees that everyone trusts her a lot. Several soldiers train, including Suzun, who soon sees Yusato and a furry thing on his back. They talk, and Yusato talks about how he adopted that bear, but Suzun gets lost admiring its cuteness and asks if she can touch it. Yusato confirms, it's gentle, and if something happens, he heals it. Blurin really seems to like biting hands. Later, Yusato notices the calluses on Suzun's hands due to training. He takes her hand to heal it, making Suzun blush. She asks if Yusato came to see her, and he replies that he came to see her and Kazuki. Maybe his honesty was his only flaw. Someone is very interested in Yusato. By the way, Kazuki went out for field training, and soon it will be Suzun's turn. Later, Yusato finally arrives home. He meets Rose, who asks about his training. Yusato pondered over his ideals and everything he had experienced so far. Previously, he didn't want to go to the battlefield unless absolutely necessary, but now he found a feeling greater than his fear. He doesn't know how to fight, nor will he take down enemies, but he will surely save Kazuki and Suzun when they need it, just like everyone else that only he can save, because he is part of the rescue team. Rose greatly admires this and says it's great. Knock out the idiots who want to sacrifice themselves and bring them back, snatch the wounded from the enemy, keep alive those who are about to die. That's our job, that's the rescue team. The next day, the king sent an invitation to Yusato, he wants him to accompany Suzun on her first field mission. The request had been made for Yusato to accompany Kazuki as well, but Rose declined since he had just returned from the forest. Upon arrival, Susan tries to flirt with Yusato again, but he's as clueless as a doorknob and doesn't understand that she wants to wield another sword. On the way, Susan is eager to touch a certain someone, and that someone is Blurin, the bear. Rose raised the alert that Yusato's magic isn't omnipotent, so don't be an idiot and be careful. She wants to take advantage of him being asleep to feel his cozy fur, but Yusato finds it strange and doesn't allow it. She asks if he happens to have a new fetish, accidentally hitting a girl's hand, but he has no idea what she's talking about. Blurin finally wakes up, 
and Yusato thinks it's better for him to walk on his own legs. Susan takes the opportunity and asks Blurin to climb on her back, so she can finally feel his fluffy fur, but Blurin is too heavy. Midway, the mage's staff warns of danger, and they prepare for a possible fight, at that moment, bandits reveal themselves. Yusato finds them lame and wonders if they were supposed to look scary. Susan calls for Yusato, and he tells her not to worry. But she's actually excited about them being bandits from another world. So, Susan uses her lightning magic and shocks one of them, restraining herself enough not to kill him. Yusato finds it amazing and tells her she doesn't need to hold back, if anything, he can heal them. Thus, he instructs her to attack like a lightning Pokemon. The mage predicts another attack coming, but this time it's red boars, they live deep in the woods, so something strange must have happened. An entire herd heads their way, and one nearly hits Susan, but Yusato steps in front of her, and they both go flying off. He uses his healing magic to protect his friend, and they end up falling into a waterfall. It's the same forest where Yusato trained before. They are swept away by the current and fall down the waterfall. Yusato manages to protect Susan with his magic. After they fall, Susan wakes up and tries to help her friend get away from the water, but he was just resting after carrying her. At that moment, Susan blushes when he wakes up and blames him for waking up too quickly. They need to find shelter, that forest is dangerous, and it will soon be dark, and they're also without food. Susan changes her clothes due to them being wet, hoping that Yusato will spy on her. Later, she uses her power to electrify the water and catch fish for dinner. She also manages to start a fire easily. Yusato is so grateful that he cries. He leaves his clothes drying by the fire, and Susan isolates herself in the corner, afraid of getting too excited about those muscles. <laughs> yeah, boy. At that moment, some sort of monkeys appear, and Susan finds them incredibly cute. Yusato had read about them in the book and warns not to touch them, they're poisonous. But Susan has already fallen into the trap of cuteness and faints. <laughs> She wouldn't survive a day in the forest. In the castle, Kazuki finds out that the two stayed in the forest. The king intends to send support the next day, but Kazuki wants to go immediately. Then, Rose appears and says that Susan and Yusato should be together, so everything will be fine. After all, Yusato is her student. In the cave, Susan talks to Yusato about being teleported to this world. She actually doesn't want to go back. Her previous life was empty, meaningless, she felt trapped in a destiny she didn't want. In this world, she can be herself and live in a kind of world she always dreamed of. Yusato shares the same way of thinking about his life. Although he's content with his life, he always wanted to be part of something bigger and lived a life of inertia. He mentions that in this world, Susan is much more human, before, she seemed unattainable. Susan likes that. She thinks it's much better to have a more intimate relationship with Yusato. Yes! 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 This embarrasses him and leaves him speechless, so he quickly pretends to be asleep. The next day, the two continue their journey. Blurin appears along the way, accompanied by the knight from before. When he saw the bear running with all his might, he thought he had found his master, so he followed. Thus, they finally manage to return to the kingdom. The king worries about both of them and apologizes for involving Yusato. Then, he asks about his training. Rose is right there, and Yusato decides to speak highly of the training so as not to provoke her. But it seems that's exactly what Rose wanted to hear. He wonders if Rose even trained him in his mental state. The king then gives Yusato and Susan a day off but asks Siglis and Rose to stay. Kazuki and Princess Celia appear, relieved to see the two safe and sound. Kazuki mentions Rose's assurance that everything would be fine by her student's side, surprising Yusato to see Kazuki so pure as to believe in Rose. In the king's chamber, they interrogate the bandits who attacked Susan's group earlier and learn about the boar incident. The boars are creatures from deep within the forest, and their demand suggests that something is coming, the demon king's army has started to act. Siglis goes to alert all defense and attack units to prepare. 
The king is somewhat hesitant to ask Rose to patrol the forest, but she willingly accepts, her legs are the fastest in the entire kingdom. King Lloyd asks if there's really nothing that would make Rose return to commanding the troops, but she declines. In her life as a commander, Rose sees that she made several mistakes and paid for them, she lost her team, her best students. The scar on her eye reminds her of it every single day, and she accepts that guilt. Her current goal is to save as many people as possible, that's why she created the rescue team. Her greatest dream is to have a student who never dies, and Yusato is her best candidate. He has determination, skill, adaptability, will to live, and never gives up. She admires him and predicts that he will become great. Later, Yusato finds that Rose left him a letter. She informs him that there will be no training the next day and asks him to deliver another letter to a certain address. Meanwhile, we see the Demon King's army led by Amila building a bridge to cross a river. Her troops notice someone on the horizon, and in the blink of an eye, a large trunk is thrown onto the bridge they were constructing. <laughs> Amila realizes it's Rose and screams in anger. Rose returns to the kingdom to report what she saw, they gained a few more days to prepare. The next day, Yusato goes to deliver the letter, people look at him much more than before, and it's really strange for him to just be walking. He passes by the shop from before, and the lady there is kind to him, asking him to take some fruits for his blue friend, he decides to pick them up on the way back. Amako, the mysterious cat-like girl, watches him from afar. Upon reaching his destination, we see the letter was for the Fleurs, and Yururu receives him. She realizes he's from the rescue team and quickly guesses it's Yusato, her brother talked a lot about him. Orga is taking care of a patient, and despite needing a lot of concentration, Yusato sees that his energy is much more intense and powerful than his. After that, the three of them gather, Yusato and Yururu talk while Orga reads the letter, which doesn't seem to bring good news. Then, a man arrives at the clinic, saying his friend fell from the roof while working and injured two more people. Orga asks for Yusato's help, and they rush over there. While healing the wounded, Yusato realizes he's only healed minor injuries so far and soon will have to heal more severe ones. Orga tells him to calm down and truly believe that he can heal everything. Yusato remembers the confidence Rose has in him and manages to reach a higher level of his healing. Later, Yusato thanks Orga for the advice, he'll remember it, and they bid farewell. Orga tells his sister that the letter was a warning about the war, they need to prepare. Yusato receives several fruits as a gift from the kind lady. Then, Amako finally confronts Yusato, saying he's the only one who can see, so perhaps he can change this future. Her eyes sparkle. Yusato has a vision of the future, he sees his friends fallen before a black knight. Amako says he must repay this favor soon. Yusato has a chilling glimpse of the future, with several people slain, including his friends Suzun and Kazuki. Amako watches him through the window, thinking that he is her only chance. Yusato goes to the castle seeking the fox girl, but doesn't have much success. Rose appears there, the knight trembles in her presence and says he needs to take care of something. Yusato comments that he still can't help but be afraid of the captain, and he understands how he feels. Rose calmly asks what he meant by that. She explains that she's returned from reconnaissance, and they have a few more days now. She also learns about the fox girl and says she knows her. That girl managed to escape from bandits and kidnappers by herself, even though she's only 10 years old. Beast folk are considered valuable prey for some people. Besides their good looks, these people also have an affinity for special magic. Yusato wonders if they can do something like illusions, something like an undesirable future. Rose knows that some of them are considered oracles, but they're extremely rare. Yusato thinks it's better not to talk too much about the subject. Rose then heads to see the king and present her report. There, Lloyd learns that their enemies are getting closer and decides to summon Kazuki and Suza. On the way, Kazuki ends up meeting Princess Celia. She likes Kazuki, and although she knows he'll need to go to war, she worries about him a lot. Back to Yusato, he ponders over the vision he had and can't sleep. He really doesn't think he should be the only one who can change this future. Balls of light appear at his window, 
and Yusato thinks it's a ghost, but it's actually Kazuki. They talk outside. Kazuki talks about the king summoning them, war is approaching. Suzun, as always, liked that very much. But on the other hand, Kazuki is really scared of it all. Out of nowhere, you're thrown into a magical medieval world and need to fight in a war to save a kingdom. Isn't that too much burden to put on someone? We see that Yusato also had an unattainable view of Kazuki, just like of Suzun. He imagined Kazuki was unshakable, simply because he was handsome. This shows how our minds deceive us, and make us have an almost perfect view of someone, especially those we admire. Kazuki and Suzun were seen as the top, unreachable by everyone at school but they fail and have fear, just like everyone else. Yusato says he will fight, but yes, he's terrified. Kazuki doesn't understand, he was thrown into all this by mistake. Yusato likes that world, he sees how much the people there value him and helped him move forward, he wants to help these people too, wants to save them. And that includes Kazuki, whether he's the great hero or not, he's still his friend. Kazuki is amazed at such determination and slaps himself in the face, saying he's made up his mind. He may not be a great hero, but he'll definitely fight for his friends and protect them. Like Yusato, he decides to face whatever comes ahead. Together, they promise to protect all the people of the kingdom. They bid farewell, and then Susan appears, saying how beautiful the friendship between men is. Yusato says he's sleepy, so it's better to talk tomorrow. Susan asks what kind of reaction that is, but Yusato had already predicted that she would show up there, after all, she also cares a lot about Kazuki. She agrees but saw that it wasn't necessary. Yusato still doesn't want him to fight, just like Susan herself, but she's different, she's already decided to stay in this world. The next day, the king announces the impending war and inspires his soldiers. Later, Kazuki visits Princess Celia and says he's going to the battlefield. Celia is happy with his visit and wishes him good luck in the fight. He calls her by her first name, which moves her. Back to Yusato, Yururu tries to pet Blurin, but can't in any way. She and Orga are there to prepare for the battle. Then, Rose calls him to her room, and Yusato wonders if he'll be punished. There, they talk a bit, and Rose says he'll work in the battle. They'll first be healing the wounded who arrive in the rear, along with Yururu and Orga. After all, in the beginning, there won't be many wounded, they would be easy targets. She hands him a box, and inside is the rescue team's outfit. He tries it on, and it fits like a glove because of his training. Rose warns him, healing users aren't immortal, when you die, it's all over. The worst thing you can do in battle is not value your own life. If he sacrifices himself, he won't be able to heal anyone anymore. And if he does that, she herself will take him down before the enemy does. Yusato understands this, and then says he will save his allies and himself too. He will continue to follow his ideals, Rose admires that. He is determined. Determined to change that vision and save them at any cost. The long journey to the battlefield began but it's taking much longer than Yururu expected, as they haven't even reached halfway yet. They're moving so far away because they want to put as much distance as possible between themselves and the kingdom when they have to fight the demon army. In front of the carriage, Yusato is traveling with Rose and asks what demons are like since he's never seen one personally. So, she explains that they look like regular humans but have twisted horns on their heads, heightened physical strength, high endurance, and possess larger energy reservoirs. Thus, they surpass most humans in ability. Rose asks if Yusato is scared now that he knows his enemies are so powerful, but he already knew they would be dangerous from the start, so that doesn't change anything. Furthermore, he already knows an even scarier monster he's forced to deal with regularly. Rose doesn't appreciate his comment, but instead of beating him, she just remains silent this time and continues leading the horse while having flashbacks of the last war with her old team. She remembers the moment when the king was addressing his generals before sending them into battle and formally informing everyone about the sighting of the demon army near the kingdom. So far, there have been no attacks thanks to Rose's efforts, but they don't know when casualties will start to appear, so they need to always be ready. As a precaution, they will assign guards to the traders traveling outside the kingdom to maintain the supply chain and leave the details of this measure to their generals to organize. 
After the initial speech, Rose is found in the hallway by Siglis, who asks what she thinks about the recent movements of the demons. She can't be sure, but if she had to guess, she would think they're preparing to launch an invasion on the kingdom, although it's still only speculation as they don't know if they really have enough forces to do such a thing. Fortunately, with the king's orders, their forces are ready to be deployed at any moment in case of such an invasion, but they hope it doesn't come to the point of being necessary. Siglis goes off to take care of some of his duties as the army commander and Rose returns to hers, thinking it might be a good idea to prepare the rescue squad for deployment if necessary. While she's lost in thought, a purple-haired girl runs up to her and tries to get her attention. The girl cries out in pain from Rose's gorilla strength punch, but Rose doesn't care about her tears and scolds her for interrupting her thoughts. The girl gets up and starts walking alongside Rose while asking if the demon army is really going to invade, but this only earns her another smack on the head, as she was clearly eavesdropping on Rose's conversation earlier. Her name is All, and she tries to be optimistic, saying they just need to push the army back and force them to retreat, but thinking of underestimating the enemy could prove to be a fatal mistake. They arrive at the base, and All squad greets her, but they notice she looks a bit pale, so they ask if something bad happened. That's when Rose declares that she'll be training them this afternoon, and everyone instantly blames All for it, as they know she must have done something to make Rose want to train them. She starts making excuses to get out of this mess, but the squad members don't believe her and a fight breaks out, while Rose just leaves, as she thinks it's none of her business. A week passes, and Rose is once again meeting with the king when he gives her the bad news that the demon army has invaded their territory. It seems they're killing monsters in the area as they go, so to the person who made the report, it looked like a group of highly trained soldiers. He suspects they're attacking monsters, so there must be a nefarious intent behind it, which they need to investigate. Thus, the king asks Rose to find out what they're doing and what they plan to achieve with it, if necessary, she can use whatever force she deems necessary, as the king has faith she won't do anything that puts her in serious danger. She thanks the king for trusting her and promises to produce results from her mission. That night, Rose meets with all squad and gives them a summary of her conversation with the king, so with that in mind, they'll set out tomorrow. One of the squad members asks what the estimated number of demons they'll face is, and from the gathered information, it seems to be around 30. They'll be troublesome if they have to face such a large force in combat, so all tries to cheer them up and tells them not to underestimate the enemy. But again, they don't want to hear that from someone like All, even though she's their leader. They had to train under Rose's command last week because of her, but she tries to defend herself, saying the training is really paying off since they're stronger than ever, which may be true, but it doesn't stop them from angrily throwing things at her. Rose catches the squad's attention and says they'll have to be completely ready for the next mission, so for that reason, she'll be going with them personally. This leaves the squad excited, as while they know Rose can be scary, she is an amazing healer, so they don't need to worry about getting hurt anymore. The next day, they enter the forest on horseback and remain alert for any suspicious activity, but they don't see anything unusual even after searching most of the day. After some discussion, they decide to search the west side of the forest as well. Some are reluctant with the idea, as the west side of the forest is known to be much more dangerous than the areas they've searched so far. For this reason, all suggests leaving the horses behind, as it would be very difficult to keep them safe along with them. The team listens to her, as she is the sub-commander of their squad after all, but this is the first time they really treat her with respect. She tells the others to rest for the search the next day, but everyone falls asleep immediately, leaving her to take the first watch. Rose tells all that she should rest too, as she wants to take the first watch while everyone else is sleeping. Rose notices All is still awake and confronts her about it. All gets up and sits near the fire to ask Rose a question. She always wondered why Rose would choose her to be the sub-commander when surely there are many better options available than her for the position. Rose asks if she's saying she's not suitable for the position, and that's exactly what All thinks of herself. The other members of the unit were personally trained by Rose to be the best at what they do, while All is only there as the sub-commander. The only thing she does is send request forms and deal with paperwork, so anyone could have taken her position and there would be no change. Rose doesn't see how that makes her unfit to handle a position, as so far she has done very well with her tasks. With how well she's doing, Rose may even pass the title of commander onto her someday. 
All doesn't want anything to do with the title of commander, as she already has enough concerns being the sub-commander, and Rose already knows how stubborn she is. She served in the cavalry without listening to orders she didn't like, even if they came from superiors, and whenever they disagreed with her, she silenced them with her strength. But then she met Rose, and suddenly all her tactics didn't work anymore. If she didn't listen to Rose, she would be reprimanded. If she tried to run from Rose, she would be reprimanded. All hates losing, just like Usato. She challenged Rose several times. Once she even tried to fight Rose, and took such a strong blow that it made her forget before and after the knockout. Rose says she didn't hit her that hard, and says that was a good joke. Everyone always gave up on All, Rose was the first one who kept challenging her, despite being annoying, All was also happy, and she thinks everyone in her unit feels the same way and that only Rose understands them, so she must continue as the commander. Rose even admires everything, but flicks her and calls her spoiled, a brat who doesn't want to leave her parents' protection. Since all said Rose is the one who understands them the most, she asks if she would hand over the leadership to someone unworthy. She didn't choose all for no reason, she chose her because she can look forward regardless of the situation, a firm and strong mindset that inspires the people around. With that said, Rose says it's time to change guard for the night watch, so she'll go to sleep now, and as she walks away to sleep, she shouts to the rest of the squad to sleep too. All looks up and sees that everyone else was awake too and heard her whole conversation with Rose. Everyone tells her they really trust her judgment and don't hate her, as long as she doesn't do anything stupid. The next day, they head west and climb a mountain, which is why they couldn't bring their horses. Once they reach the summit, they find some alarming footprints, the claw marks of a wolf and fresh blood. It seems the demons are really hunting monsters around here, but what would be the point of entering human territory just to hunt monsters? At that moment, they hear a loud roar coming from the forest, so Rose orders them to get into battle formation as they hurry to the scene. We see a wolf being taken down by a group of demons and put into captivity. The squad is watching from a nearby bush and awaits instructions from Rose to avoid detection, but the demon leader still manages to find out they're there somehow. Rose stands up along with the others and confronts the demon about his reasons for being in human territory. He says he doesn't particularly like this mission he's been tasked with, but it will be beneficial to the demon realm, so he had no choice but to do it. He won't tell her what these benefits are, however. Rose still wants to avoid conflict, so she tells him that if he and his troops leave quietly, she can overlook this transgression. But the demon has orders to keep this mission secret, so now that they've seen, he can't let any of them leave here alive. Rose puts all in charge of the team, as she won't be able to give commands while busy with the demon commander. The demon commander advances against Rose while his subordinates fight with all and the others, and the demon commander starts by casting a spell to protect himself with wind. Rose still manages to keep up with him and eventually kicks him back with her insane strength, but at that moment he also manages to cut her leg, which will be harder than she initially thought. So, Rose leaves things in all and the other's hands as she goes to deal with him. As Rose pursues him into the forest, the demon commander tries to escape by launching stealth attacks and fleeing when he has the opportunity. However, something he didn't count on was that Rose can hold an entire tree with one hand and throw it like a soccer ball. Rose throws a tree straight at him, but even that wasn't enough to bring the demon down, as he frees himself and casts a blade barrier of wind around Rose. Normally, going through that thing would cause thousands of cuts that would lead to an agonizing death, but with Rose, she can heal all the damage received and come out like nothing happened. The demon recognizes how powerful Rose is as a healer, so he introduces himself as Nero Argents and asks for her name. After she gives her name, he summons his sword and declares that he'll kill her here today, and Rose declares she'll defeat him before he has the chance. <laughs> Meanwhile, Rose's squad continues fighting against the demons, and they even handle them quite well. In Rose's fight, she realizes that sword seems to be imbued with some curse, it's better not to let it touch her. Nero advances with wind magic, but he's met with a violent punch from his adversary. Nero is surprised by his enemies, he values them, saying they're the most troublesome group he's faced. Nero thought humans no longer had powerful individuals like them. For this reason, they must end them here and now, so their master can return without problems, the demons are willing to sacrifice everything for this cause. The remaining demons start acting like zombies, even those defeated. And with incredible strength, 
they overpower Rose's team. All tries to calm them down, but they are defeated one by one. Rose panics, Nero prevents her from going back to her comrades, but due to her anger, she lost her composure. Thus, Nero manages to strike her in the eye with his sword. Rose tries to heal herself, but it doesn't work. Thus, we learn that Nero's crimson sword cuts through mana, temporarily cursing wounds, not even healing magic works. Her companions ask for help, but Rose can't reach them, her vision is blurry, and she loses the sense of distance. Nero is about to finish her off for once, but before that, all appears in front of her and protects her from the fatal blow. Rose sees the terrible scene of her deceased comrades, her eyes tremble in disbelief, they trusted her, and she couldn't protect them. She thinks all should have fled, and that she was relying too much on her own power. Nero says he'll forget about the deaths of his subordinates as he'll forget about hers and attacks her again. But Rose simply grabs the cursed sword and unleashes a barrage of powerful punches while asking what he could know about her team. Rose pummels him as if he were a straw doll, shaking him back and forth several times, and to finish, she punches him in the stomach with all her might, sending Nero straight into a tree and hitting him with his own sword. Rose's body starts wavering due to the injuries, but she thinks she needs to end this at any cost. Then, a younger version of Amila appears, crying for her master. Rose is perplexed to see that scene, Nero sacrifices his own allies, and yet, they care so much about him. Rose sees the rest of all in Amila, and simply can't act, even becoming angry with herself. She hears all calling for her, Rose crawls to her partner and tries to heal her, but it's no use, the wound is cursed. Despite Rose continuing to insist on healing her, all says she doesn't need to, she knows it's futile. She has no regrets, she's happy to have fought alongside Rose. Rose tells her to stop with this farewell talk, but all responds that everyone thinks the same way so she asks her to continue being someone they admire. Thus, all dies in her arms. A lump forms in her throat, Rose had never felt so powerless before. Upon returning to the kingdom, Rose reports that the demon lord is returning, and to finish, she makes an appeal to Lloyd. She begs him to remove her commander position and revoke her knighthood. Lloyd asks if that's really what she wants, she confirms, she feels she no longer deserves the right to call herself a knight. On the way home, Rose is approached by a couple, they say they are Josh's parents, one of her subordinates. Rose is overwhelmed with sadness and asks for their forgiveness, but they are grateful to her, thankful for bringing their boy back, he had a look of fulfillment, he was always a delinquent and began to smile more when he became part of Rose's team, they are very grateful. Upon arriving home, the deafening silence of the empty house hits Rose so violently that she can barely stand. Longing and guilt permeate the house, and perhaps it will never leave Rose's mind at peace. A month passes, Siglis visits her, and they talk. She says that Lloyd, the king, visited her to check the same as Siglis, to see if she hadn't crawled into the grave with her team, and she says it's an option. Siglis grabs her by the collar trying to give her a sermon, but Rose says it was just a thought, she wouldn't do that. Siglis notices that the curse is fading more and more and asks why she doesn't make an effort to heal her eye. Later, we see that Rose decided to leave the wound in her eye, to remind her of her mistake, of her comrades she couldn't save. All saved her life, and she intends to value that. She thinks about seeking revenge and killing as many demons as she can, but that's not the answer. Sitting in the room, she has a glimpse of the house full and everyone having fun. She finds it pathetic and wonders what her comrades would say if they saw her like this? Then, all appears there, saying that nothing remains the same forever, and she needs to accept that to move forward. All reminds her of what she said in her last words, continue being someone we admire. Then, the rest of her comrades appear, agreeing, giving her strength to move forward. Rose's eyes overflow with emotion, but she promises that this is the last time she shows weakness.
So, after leaving behind positive energies and expressing how much they love and admire Rose, they fade away like a dream. Rose is moved once again, now she makes up her mind. Rose decides. A great battle approaches, and many warriors will die, but she will prevent that. She will create a team of at least five people, she will need at least two healers and someone like her, someone who can not only heal but run through the battlefield destroying any threat around her, that would be impossible for a normal person. I confess that this scent shivers down my spine. Returning to the present, Rose says she's very happy to have found Yusato, he's surprised by something so unexpected. Rose says he has no idea how rare someone like them is and asks what it would be like if every healing user were like her. Yusato replies that it would be the end of the world. She punches Yusato in the stomach. She meant it's an impossible situation, she herself thought about training beyond limits while using healing magic. Rose finally found someone exactly as she wished, someone capable of matching her, now she's sure he won't die. The group of warriors took a break in their journey and set up a camp to rest. Yusato seems restless, the day of battle is drawing nearer. Susan greets her friend, praising his uniform, then shows off her newest armor. She becomes very excited and even blushes as she shows it to Yusato. She says it's not only beautiful but also supports her thunder magic. Susan is thrilled with her new armor and can't wait to show off her figure to her crush, Yusato. But Yusato acts like an idiot and says she's not that cute. She ignores his comment and says he's just being Sundra and hiding his shyness. She tells him it's okay and that she's eager to see his cute side as she rushes to hug him. But Yusato runs away like a true virgin and even calls for help from his friend Kazuki. <laughs> Kazuki suddenly appears, holding Susan by the arms, saying that they need to regroup with Siglis. Susan says she will go right after devouring Yusato. She ends up going with Kazuki, but warns Yusato that when she returns, she will definitely ride him until he surrenders. After Susan fails to make Yusato a man, we learn that a spy brought information from the enemy army, and they position themselves efficiently to combat them. All the soldiers will clear a path for Susan and Kazuki to reach the enemy leader and defeat him once and for all. The two prepare, and Kazuki sees that his friend is hesitant, even trying to distract herself with Yusato. Susan realizes her friend is indeed perceptive, she's a bit uncomfortable but also excited. She has changed a lot from her otherworldly version, her past self no longer exists, and she's happy about it since Yusato accepted her as she is now. Kazuki asks to know more about it, but Susan promises to tell him when they return from the battle. Now, he has one more reason to stay alive. Meanwhile, the two sense the presence of the enemy. The allied mages prepare and begin shooting along with Kazuki and Susan, but the enemies ahead disappear, it was an illusion. They see the real enemies coming from the other side and rush to defend themselves. Now, let's move to Rose and her team, those in black attire will enter the battle and retrieve all the wounded they find. She instructs them to go and come back alive. Orga and Yururu wear grey outfits, they will tend to the wounded in that tent while the knight Aruka protects them. Rose and Yusato will go to the front line along with the progress of the battle, until then, they'll stay with the grey group. Yusato hopes his friends are okay, Yururu reassures him but asks him to also be careful when going to the front line. At this moment, one of their allies brings two wounded soldiers. Yusato sees how serious the injury is and starts trembling with the adrenaline of war. The wounded warrior says she was thrown by a giant snake. Yusato remembers the monster he faced before but tells the injured soldier to rest now. In battle, the knights struggle to fight the enemies, one of those giant snakes attacks and subdues them easily. Meanwhile, the black knight sees it as a waste of time to be there, his enemies are too weak. Suddenly, a knight from the kingdom attacks him from behind and manages to pierce a sword through the black knight. However, the enemy doesn't seem bothered at all. The warrior starts dying from the pain in his body, he falls just from the overwhelming presence of his enemy. The Black Knight sees how weak humans are and prepares to finish him off, but before that, he is attacked with foul-smelling balls, getting distracted. When he looks for the fallen soldier, he had already been taken away by Rose's team. The Black Knight sees that he's one of the kidnappers mentioned by Amila and gets excited about it. At the wounded camp, Rose says the time has come and asks if her pupil is ready. Yusato affirms he is, as he's been trained to be her right hand. 
Rose sees she doesn't need to worry about anything, and Yusato is surprised to see her concerned. They leave things with Yururu and Orga, who wish them good luck. Rose and her protege Yusato rush to the battlefield, and on the way, Rose mentions a knight in dark armor, troublesome. Yusato recalls his vision of the future, the same black knight who subdued everyone. A tightness in Yusato's heart makes him stop for a moment. Rose asks if everything is okay and decides to give him one last piece of advice. She knows Yusato can't kill anyone, but when he's cornered, that will be a big problem. She then teaches him a special technique. In the battlefield, Yusato does his job and rescues a wounded soldier, avoiding the demons with his great speed. Rose, like a true brute, knocks down everything in her path. <laughs> Susan and Kazuki defeat several enemies on the front line, none of them are a real challenge, but something seems to bother Susan. Kazuki asks if everything is okay, but she brushes it off. The Black Knight finally arrives, and Susan quickly realizes he's a bigger problem. The lesser knights attack him without issues, but the enemy doesn't seem bothered, even when pierced by spears. His armor distorts and counterattacks the soldiers. <laughs> Kazuki tries to attack him with his light magic, but Susan stops him. Her strike grazes the enemy's shoulder, surprising him. He had never seen light magic before. Kazuki is confused, but Susan quickly explains that the enemy's magic must reflect all the blows that hit him. Indeed, Kazuki receives the same wound as his enemy, making his shoulder bleed. The Black Knight sees how clever Susan is, no one had ever noticed his magic so quickly. He asks them not to flee, he finally found someone interesting. As we turn to Yusato, he starts to have a terrible headache. His vision of the future begins to fill his mind in all forms, and he staggers on the battlefield, giving the enemies an opening. Before being hit, one of his allies, saved by him, helps him. Yusato thanks him and asks where the two heroes are, he learns they are in the center of the great fight and rushes there as fast as possible. Meanwhile, the two heroes contemplate how they can attack an enemy who reflects all attacks. Susan has a risky idea, but Yusato can heal them afterward. The enemy's armor behaves like a symbiote and attacks the heroes. Susan tests her hypothesis and blocks the enemy's vision, attacking with Kazuki, causing minor wounds, but all are reflected. She thought he couldn't reflect attacks he couldn't see, but apparently she was wrong. However, she sees that the attack on the back was not reflected like the others. Thus, she puts her plan into action again and uses an ability. Kazuki runs to the other side and uses his magic as a bright light that blinds the enemy. Susan then attacks from behind and pierces the Black Knight's throat, silencing him. She understood that attacks outside the enemy's knowledge cannot be reflected, and now without his voice, he can't activate this ability. Kazuki then attacks with all his might, but to everyone's surprise, the enemy was just pretending. The blows are reflected again, Kazuki is impaled by the Black Knight's sword, and Susan is fatally wounded. The knight's ability is automatic, just by his will. He didn't reflect the previous attack simply because he didn't want to, leaving false hope in the hero's hands. He doesn't even need to speak to activate his power, there's no one who can harm him. Susan shivers, her life is slipping away, and in her last moments, she apologizes to Yusato. Thank you for watching, leave a like if you enjoyed the video, subscribe, and hit the bell to catch next week's episode. See you next time.